Do I hear, Senator Warner, uh, just this discussion of the last few minutes that maybe the revenue side may end up being easier than the entitlement side? Well, once again, you, I'm sure this stat has been thrown out today. You know, spending's at 25% of GDP, all-time high. Revenues are roughly 15.3%, 60-year low. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize that delta can't be continued. So you've got to have a mix and rethink how you can get a tax code that will be fairer, flatter, progressive, that will generate revenue. And most of the times we've balanced over the last 80, 100 years, they've generally been in that 19.5 to 20.5% range, revenues and, and spending. How you can cut back on some of the, the entitlement programs, make them sustainable, have that safety net. And let me assure you, Dick Durbin sometimes you know, uh, uh, has been very aggressive at making sure that, the, as Mitch Daniel said, the purpose of government in terms of taking care of those who are most in need get protected. And I think we, you know, we have made so much more progress than, than most have assumed. And on top of that, I think what we've also worked through, or at least thought through, is how do you then take this idea? There's a lot of ideas floating around, but how do you then actually get a process that could get it through the Senate and again get it through the House and get it signed by the President? And one thing you have to remember, too, when we're talking about revenues, we're talking about reforming a tax code to make the corporate side much more competitive for corporations around the world. And right now, with uh, Japan doing what they've done recently, the United States stands to be the, um, have the highest corporate tax rate of any industrialized country. That's not right. Um, and by using the same approach on the corporate side as we've referenced on the personal side, we can lower those corporate rates down to something that uh, is really meaningful and significant and will put corporations in America in a position to, to uh, also broaden that base by stimulating the economy and adding jobs. And that's, that was the purpose of Simpson Bowles and, and that's been our purpose also. So that you gain revenue from the corporate, from the corporate revenue side well, or that it's revenue neutral? On the corporate side, it's intended to be revenue neutral. What about that? Well, here's the way I see it. We have a nominal corporate income tax rate and then we have an actual corporate income tax rate. And depending on your sector in the economy, if you are a small business, you're probably closer to the actual stated corporate income tax rate. If you are a larger company, as we learned with General Electric not too long ago, you may have a zero corporate tax rate. So the tax code rewards certain sectors of our business and their taxes are much lower. I think what we're trying to achieve is to try to create an opportunity for economic growth here by lowering the marginal corporate rate, doing it in a fair fashion so that at the end of the day, we don't give up on the revenue that comes in from the corporate side. I mean, that, that is what we're wrestling with here. It isn't easy but I think it's a reasonable thing to do. I'll say one other thing if I can. I don't know if you want to get into it at this moment, Judy. The entitlement discussion is important to all of us, and maybe I've had the most to say in this group about it uh, uh, when it comes to what I'm trying to do. I really honestly believe there has to be a safety net in America. There are vulnerable people in this country who will be vulnerable because of the economy, because of their status in life and the like. And there is more vulnerability today among many people because of two things. The first of which is the disparity in income, where many people are working harder and falling further behind. And the second is the uncertainty of their future. Savings took a hit not that many years ago. Pensions fell by the wayside in bankruptcy proceedings. And so when people talk about Social Security, it isn't about some program dating back to Franklin Roosevelt, it is literally their safety net. And it, they get very nervous when they hear us talking about it. I happened to be around in 83 when we went through the bipartisan exercise and extended Social Security. What was interesting, when it was done on a bipartisan basis, clearly to save Social Security, it didn't cost either party a seat in the next election. It wasn't an issue. Charlie Stenholm's in the front row over here, he remembers that. It really wasn't an issue because we'd done it in a bipartisan fashion, and we did it for the good of Social Security. Well, Senator Chambliss, is that the kind of discussion at that level that you're having in, in the group, or is, has it gotten more granular than that? I mean, are you still having these philosophical 
discussions? Well, obviously, you can't have a discussion about uh, the policy without getting philosophical, but we've gotten beyond that. Um, I mean, we know where Dick's coming from, let me tell you. We, we've had some pretty strong <laughs> philosophical <laughs> arguments there. We, we know where um, uh, Tom Coburn, who's probably on the other extreme, uh, is coming from. Um, but we've been able to sit there and get beyond those philosophical arguments, say, okay, uh, we know where you are, Dick, or we know where you are, Tom, but look, guys, we, we, got, to, we got to figure out some way to find the common ground on, on whether it was entitlements or whether it's revenue policy or what. And, and again, I go back to what I said initially. I, it's the way the Senate was designed to work, and I'm very proud to be associated with guys because it has worked. And Even though Saxby may have just called me an extremist, uh, <laughs> I want to say extremism in the pursuit, well, well I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Senator Crapo, uh, while you're doing this, uh, you know, Senator Chambliss a minute ago used the word arrows. Y you and he and Senator Coburn in particular, not to say the Democrats haven't been taking some arrows too, but in particular you've taken some arrows on your side from uh, those who believe that taxes just should not happen. And, uh, you know, I think of Grover Norquist, Americans for Tax Reform, there are other names I could mention. Are you truly able to function ignoring all that, that uh, opinion out there and, and that is making itself known to you on a regular basis? Well, let me tell you, Judy, when we first voted for the Fiscal Commission report, the knives came out, right, Dick? And they haven't gone back in since. I mean, the fact is that when you are seriously talking about reforming the entire fiscal paradigm of the United States of America at a time of fiscal crisis like that which we face. Uh, we're talking about everything literally being on the table and being open for discussion. And the groups that uh, I think sometimes like to create conflict, but uh, whether that's right or wrong, uh, the groups that have an interest in the outcome of these phenomenally broad number of issues are uh, engaged. And I would say that the uh, arrows is a polite way to put it, the, the attacks uh, have been on both sides intense. Nevertheless, we can get past that. And, and frankly, I think a lot of these groups are going to be pretty happy when they see the ultimate outcome because a lot of the fears they have are not as real as the product that we are working on. The bottom line here is that we have to continually remember that the status quo is also an option. It's not a good option. And in fact, uh, I think that it's probably the worst option of any of the options that we have in front of us as a nation. But as Americans understand that, then they become much more willing to engage in the, in the serious kind of discussion that we've had in this group that has helped to find ideas. And what we found is that thinking outside of the box, if you will, or working on new paradigms, we can find ways to achieve the objectives that we have across a political spectrum in ways that will provide popular support and political support. Well, I want to pursue that because there are folks out there saying, well, it's great for the six of you or the five of you to be working on this, but in the political, the real political world, it's going to be very difficult to turn what you do into real legislation. Well, Jay, so how do you, well, remember, Jay, how do you look at that? Look at some of the markers out there. You know, we had 64 senators a number of weeks back who kind of Said, "Atta boy, stay at it, you guys." You know, you'd be surprised at the number of senators who are viewed as one end or the other of the political extreme who've said to every one of us individually, "Stay at this." Because what is the alternative? The alternative is you know, the potential of a debt crisis without the tools that government has had in the past in terms of fiscal policy and monetary policy. Interest rates at traditional levels that would take an economy that is slowly starting to recover, but is recovering, to grind it to a halt at a time when you've got a potential another debt crisis in Europe, instability in the commodity markets. The notion that we wouldn't step up and, and try to put forward something that is transformative would just, you know, I said to Peggy Newton earlier, you know, the coalition government in the UK had a deeper problem, and they have stepped up. Now, we've got a different political system, but we would let the Brits outdo us? It's downright un-American. And I think there is enormous sense, and where it, I think as we found, Saxby and I have done a little bit of a roadshow on this. You get outside the groups who want to preserve the status quo in this town, 
And Americans want to do their part. They want to be for something as long as they feel like it's something that everybody's got some skin in the game. And a lot of the plans that have been put out there so far have been accurately or not portrayed as you know, disproportionately one part of America versus another part of America bearing too much of the burden. I think the notion of what we are going to put out, or hopefully we can get to, is uh, something where everybody's going to have some skin in the game. And I think you'll have enormous amounts of folks step up. And we've known from day one this was going to be a difficult process in and of itself. But even if we as a group of six were able to agree, selling it to our colleagues was going to be even tougher. So we, we've not had any um, complicated feelings about that. It's, um, it's always been understood that it was not going to be an easy sale, and that's why it's been so difficult to find the right kind of common ground, um, and why it's been so difficult at the end, because in any negotiation, the, the major issues are always the ones you kind of put off till the end, and that's kind of uh, where we are, and that's why it got so difficult right at the end. So coming to the end, does that mean you're close to coming out with a, re with a report? I ask you because you've got the, the negotiations underway with Vice President being led by Vice President Biden, and you were just telling me there's discussion, informal discussion between the two groups. Is that accurate? Well, yeah, it's very informal. I mean, I've kept John Kyle as well as Mitch McConnell apprised of where we are, not the details necessarily, but where we are in the process all the way through this from the very first day that Mark and I sat down together and uh, started visiting on this. Well, how is but, your track different from that track? Well, we're, we're not integrated with them at all, other than the fact that you've got Democrats and Republicans sitting down at a table in that group, and obviously we are in our group, but, but what they have been focused on, um, as directed by the President, I think rightly so, is the debt ceiling vote, and what's it going to take to get 60 votes to to raise the debt ceiling. We've always been more focused on the long-term issue because right. they're not going to solve the $14 trillion debt. I, I don't think there's any way. Um, that's so, what we have had our, our sights on from, from early on. So how do you see your timetable? How do you see this unfolding uh, going forward? I mean, I think all four of us would like to sit here today and tell you that come next week we're going to roll out this plan that everybody's going to be totally happy with. But uh, number one, we're not there. And secondly, when we get to that point, and we still hope we will, um, it's going to be a plan that everybody's going to dislike in some respects because all of America is going to have to share in the sacrifice if we're truly going to get this debt under control and address what Mike Mullen, the ch uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs, has said is the number one national security interest of our country, and, and uh, that is to start paying down this debt. As, as uh, Mark referenced a minute ago, we got spending up here and we got revenues down here. We've not only get, got to get it in balance, we've got to get revenues above spending so that we can start paying that mortgage. If we don't do that, then we're not going to show the good faith in the marketplace that the people that buy our bonds are going to uh, require us to show. So it's, um, it's going to be uh, a difficult process at best to convince folks of it. And we're not there yet, and we can't say that we're going to be there next week or the week after, but we're going to continue to, to dialogue about it.